we're investigating the impact of the Black Death, both its social consequences and, of course, its economic consequences on Europe. Now, well into the 13th century, Europe had experienced rather good harvests, and they had an expanding population. But by the end of the century, a period of disastrous changes had begun. So let's look at the famine and population. Toward the end of the 13th century, noticeable changes in weather patterns were occurring as Europe entered a period that is often called or referred to as the Little Ice Age. There was a small drop in overall temperatures that resulted in shortened growing seasons and terrible weather conditions, which included severe storms and constant rain. So between 1315 and 1317, heavy rains in northern Europe destroyed harvests and caused serious food shortages, resulting in extreme hunger and starvation. The Great Famine expanded to other parts of Europe in an all-too-familiar pattern, as evident in a scene described by uh, somebody that chronicled the, the times. Um, he says, We saw a large number of both sexes, not only from nearby places, but from as much as five leagues away, barefooted and maybe even, except for women, in a completely nude state, together with their priests, coming in procession at the Church of the Holy Mart Martyrs, uh, their bones bulging out, devoutly carrying bodies of saints and other relics to be adorned, hoping to get relief. Now, some historians estimate that the famine killed 10% of the European population in the first half of the 14th century. Europe had experienced a great increase in population in the High Middle Ages. Uh, by 1300, however, indications are that Europe had reached the upper limit of its population, not in an absolute sense, but in the number of people who could be supported by existing agricultural production and technology. Virtually all productive land was being farmed, including many marginal lands that needed intensive cultivation and proved easily susceptible to changing weather patterns. We know that there was also a movement from overpopulated rural areas to urban locations. 18% of the people in the village of Broughton in England, for example, migrated between uh, 1288 and 1340. Now, there is no certainty that these migrants found better economic opportunities in the cities. We could, in fact, conclude the opposite based on the reports of increasing numbers of poor people in the cities. Um, in 1330, for example, uh, there was an estimate that 100,000 inhabitants of Florence, um, 17,000 of them, were paupers. Moreover, evidence suggests oh, that because of the growing population, by 1300, individual peasant holdings were shrinking in size to an acreage that could no longer support a peasant family. Europe seemed to have reached an upper limit to population growth, and the number of poor appeared to have increased noticeably. Now, some historians have pointed out that famine may have led to chronic malnutrition, and that makes sense. Um, that malnutrition can then in turn contribute to increased infant mortality, lower birth rates, higher susceptibility to disease because of those malnourished uh, people, they also are less able to resist infection. This, they argue, helps explain the high mortality of the Great Plague known as the Black Death. So it's in the mid-14th century that the disaster known as the Black Death strikes Asia, uh, or struck Asia, North Africa, and Europe. Although there were several types of plague, the most common and most important form in the diffusion of the Black Death was the bubonic plague, which was spread by black rats infested with fleas who were the hosts to the deadly bacterium. Now, the Great Plague originated in Asia. After disappearing from Europe and the Middle East in the Middle Ages, bubonic plague continued to haunt areas of southwestern China 
In the early 1300s, rats accompanying Mongol troops spread the plague into central China and by 1331 to northeastern China. In one province near Beijing, it was reported that 90% of the population died. Overall, China's population may have declined from the 120 million that it was in the mid-14th century to 80 million by 1400. In the 13th century, the Mongols had brought much of the Eurasian landmass under a single rule, which in turn facilitated long-distance trade, particularly along the Silk Road, which you should remember from world history. Uh, that Silk Road was now dominated by Muslim merchants from Central Asia. And along this route, the movement of people and goods facilitated the spread of the plague. In the 1330s, there were outbreaks of the plague in Central Asia, and along later through the Black Sea, eventually in 1346, and in Constantinople by 1347. Its arrival in the Byzantine Empire was noted by Emperor John VI, who lost a son. Uh, he said, upon arrival in Constantinople, she, the Empress, found Andronicus, the youngest born, dead from the invading plague, which attacked almost all the seacoasts of the world and killed most of their people. By 1348, the plague had spread to Egypt, Mecca, and Damascus, as well as to other parts of the Middle East. So this makes the Black Death of the mid-14th century the most devastating natural disaster in European history of the time. It ravaged Europe's population, causing economic, social, political, and cultural upheaval. Uh, contemporary chroniclers lamented that parents attempted to flee, abandoning their children. One related the, world, the words of a child left behind, um, something along the lines of, Oh, Father, why have you abandoned me? Mother, where have you gone? The first line is almost like Christ on the cross. My Father, why have you abandoned me? People were horrified by an evil force that they didn't understand, and then the subs subsequent breakdown of all the normal human relations that they had known. Now, the symptoms of bubonic plague included a high fever, aching joints, swelling of the lymph nodes, and dark blotches caused by bleeding beneath the skin. Bubonic plague was, plague was actually the least toxic form of the plague, but nevertheless it killed 50 to 60 percent of its victims. In pneumonic plague, the bacterial infection spread to the lungs, resulting in severe coughing, um, bloody sputum, and the relatively easy spread of the bacillus from human to human by coughing. The plague reached Europe in October of 1347, when merchants brought it to the island of Sicily off the coast of Italy. Now, one contemporary wrote, As it happened, among those who escaped from Caffa by boat, there were a few sailors who had been infected with the poisonous disease. Some boats were bound for Genoa, others went to Venice, and other Christian areas. When the sailors reached these places and mixed with the people there, it was as if they had brought evil spirits with them. The plague spread quickly, reaching southern Italy and southern France and Spain by the end of 1347. Now usually the diffusion of the Black Death followed commercial trade routes. In 1348, the plague spread through France and the Low Countries and into Germany. By the end of that year, it had moved to England, ravaging it in 1349. By the end of 1349, the plague had expanded to Northern Europe and Scandinavia. Eastern Europe and Russia were affected by 1351, although mortality rates were never as high in Eastern Europe as they were in Western and Central Europe. Now, mortality figures for the Black Death were incredibly high. Italy was hit especially hard, as you can imagine, with trade, as the commercial center of the Mediterranean 
Italy possessed scores of ports where the plague could be introduced. Italy's crowded cities, whether large, such as, as Florence, uh, Genoa, and Venice, they had populations near 100,000, or the small areas, uh, small areas like Orvieto and Pistoia, they suffered losses of 50 to 60 percent. France and England were also particularly devastated. In northern France, farming villages suffered mortality rates of 30 percent, while cities such as Rouen were more severely affected and experienced losses as high as 40 percent. In England and Germany, entire villages simply disappeared. In Germany, of approximately 170,000 inhabitants, only 130,000 were left by the end of the 14th century. It has been estimated that the European population declined by 25 to 50 percent between 1347 and 1351. If we accept the recent scholarly assessment of a European population of 75 million, in the early 14th century, this means a death toll of 19 to 38 million people in four years. And the plague did not end in 1351. There were major outbreaks again in 1361 to 1362, and later in 1369. And then there were recurrences every five or six to 10 or 12 years. Of course, those reoccurrences depended on climatic and ecological conditions until the end of the 15th century. The European population thus did not begin to recover until around 1500, and it took several generations after that to reattain 13th century levels. Now, reactions to the plague vary. When you have a natural disaster that has the magnitude of this great plague, it can produce extreme psychological reactions. People either threw themselves into religion or the opposite. As a matter of fact, some people, knowing they could be dead in a matter of days, those people begin to live for the moment, and they threw themselves with abandon into sexual and alcoholic orgies. The 14th century Italian writer Giovanni excuse me, Giovanni Boccaccio gave a classic description of this kind of reaction to the plague in Florence in the preface to his famous Decameron. And he said, Some people held that plenty of drinking and enjoyment, singing and free living, and the gratification of the appetite in every possible way, letting the devil take the hindmost was best preventative. And as far as they could, they suited that the action to the word. Day and night, they went from one tavern to another, drinking and carousing unrestrainedly. At the least inkling of something that suited them, they ran wild in other people's houses, and there was no one to prevent them, for everyone had abandoned all responsibility for his belongings, as well as for himself, considering his days numbered. Now, Wealthy and powerful people fled to their country estates, as uh, Boccaccio recounted. Still others maintained that no remedy against plagues was better than to leave them miles behind. Men and women without number, caring for nobody but themselves, abandoned the city, their houses and estates, their own flesh and blood even, and their effects in search of a country place. The attempt to explain the, the Black Death and mitigate its harshness led to extreme sorts of behavior. To many people, the plague had either been sent by God as a punishment for human sins or been caused by the devil. Some resorted to extreme, um, um, extreme asceticism to cleanse themselves of sin and gain God's forgiveness. Such were the flagellants, whose movement became popular in 1348, especially in Germany. Groups of flagellants, both men and women, wandered from town to town flogging themselves with whips to win the forgiveness of God, whom they believe had sent the plague to punish humans for their sinful ways. One contemporary chronicler described a flagellant procession as 
following. The penitents went about, coming first out of Germany. They were men who did public penance and scourged themselves with whips and hard knotted leather with little iron spikes. Some made themselves bleed very badly between the shoulder blades, and some foolish women had cloths ready to catch the blood and smear it on their eyes, saying it was miraculous blood. While they were doing penance, they sang very mournful songs about the Nativity and the Passion of our Lord. The object of this penance was to put a stop to the mortality, for in that time, at least a third of all the people in the world died. The flagellants attracted attention and created mass hysteria wherever they went. The Catholic Church, however, became alarmed when flagellant groups began to kill Jews and attack clergy who opposed them. Some groups also developed a millenarian expect. Yes, a millenarian aspect, anticipating the imminent end of the world, the return of Jesus and the establishment of a thousand-year kingdom under his governance. Pope Clement VI condemned the flagellants in October of 1349 and urged the public authorities to crush them. By the end of 1350, most of the flagellant movement had been destroyed. An outbreak of virulent anti-Semitism also accompanied the Black Death. Jews were accused of causing the plague by poisoning town wells. Although Jews were persecuted in Spain, the worst organized massacres, or pogroms, against this helpless minority were carried out in Germany. More than 60 major Jewish communities in Germany had been exterminated by 1351. Many Jews fled eastward to Russia, and especially to Poland, where the king offered them protection. Eastern Europe became home to a large Jewish community. The prevalence of death because of the plague and its recurrences affected people in profound ways. Some survivors apparently came to treat life as something cheap and transient. Violence and violent death appeared to be more common after the plague than before. Post-plague Europe also demonstrated a morbid preoccupation with death. In their sermons, priests reminded parishioners that each night's sleep might be their last. Even tombstones had... Uh, images of naked corpses that were in various stages of decomposition with snakes entwined in their bones and their innards filled with worms. The population collapse of the 14th century had dire economic and social consequences. Economic dislocation was accompanied by social upheaval. Between 1,000 and 1,300 Europe had been relatively stable. The division of society into three estates of clergy, those who pray, nobility, those who fight, and laborers, those who work, had already begun to disintegrate in the 13th century, however. In the 14th century, a series of urban and rural revolts rocked European society. Both peasants and noble landlords were affected by the demographic crisis of the 14th century. Most noticeably, Europe experienced a serious labor shortage that caused a dramatic rise in the price of labor. At Coxham Manor in England, for example, a farm laborer who had received two shillings a week in 1347 was paid seven in 1349 and almost eleven by 1350. At the same time, the decline in population depressed or held stable the demand for agricultural produce, resulting in stable or falling prices for output, although in England prices remained high probably until the 1380s. The chronicler Henry Knighton observed, and this is his quote, as the price of everything was cheap, a man could buy a horse for half a mark, which was six shillings, which before was worth 40 shillings. Because landlords were having to pay more for labor at the same time that their rents or incomes were declining, they began to experience considerable adversity and lower standards of living. In England, aristocratic income dropped more than 20% between 1347 and 1353. Aristocrats responded to adversity by seeking to lower the wage rate. 
the English Parliament passed the Statute of Laborers in 1351, which attempted to limit wages to pre-plague level, pre levels um, and forbid the mobility of peasants as well, although such laws provide, or excuse me, proved largely unworkable, they did keep wages from rising as high as they might have in a totally free market. Overall, the position of landlords continued to deteriorate during the late 14th and early 15th centuries. At the same time, conditions for peasants improved, though not uniformly throughout Europe. The decline in the number of peasants after the Black Death accelerated the process of converting labor services to rents, freeing peasants from the obligations of servile tenure and weakening the system of manorialism. But there were limits to how much the peasants could advance. Not only did they face the same economic hurdles as the lords, but the latter attempted to impose wage restrictions, reinstate old forms of labor service, and create new obligations. New governmental taxes also hurt. Peasant complaints became widespread, and soon they gave rise to rural revol revolts. In 1358, a peasant revolt known as the Zachary broke out in northern France. The destruction of normal order by the Black Death and the subsequent economic dislocation were important factors in causing that revolt, but the ravages created by the Hundred Years' War also affected French peasantry, and we'll understand that when we talk about the Hundred Years' War next. Both the French and English forces followed a deliberate policy of laying waste to peasants' fields, while bands of mercenaries lived off the land by taking peasants' produce as well. Peasant anger was also exacerbated by growing class tensions. Landed nobles were eager, eager to hold on to their politically privileged position, and they felt increasingly threatened in the new post-plague world of higher wages and lower prices. Many aristocrats looked on peasants with utter contempt. A French tale told to upper-class audiences contained this remarkable package, or excuse me, passage. Tell me, Lord, if you please, by what right or title does a peasant eat beef? Should they eat fish? Rather, let them eat thistles and briars, thorns and straw and hay on Sunday, and pea pods on weekdays. They should keep watch without sleep and have trouble always. That is how peasants should live. Yet each day they are full and drunk on the best wines and in fine clothes. The great expenditures of peasants come as at a high cost, for it is this that destroys and ruins the world. It is they who spoil the common welfare. From the peasants comes all unhappiness. Should they eat meat? Rather, should they chew grass on the heath with the horned cattle and go naked on all fours? Well... The peasants reciprocated this contempt for their so-called social superiors. The outbursts of peasant anger led, led to savage confrontations. Castles were burned and nobles were murdered. Such atrocities did not go unanswered, however. The Zachary soon failed as the privileged classes closed ranks, savagely massacred the rebels, and ended the revolt. But the French weren't the only people that revolted. The English Peasants' Revolt of 1381 was the most prominent of all. It was a product not of desperation, but of rising expectations. After the Black Death, the condition of English peasants had improved as they enjoyed greater freedom and higher wages or lower rents. Aristocratic landlords had fought back with legislation to depress wages and attempted to reimpose old feudal dues. The most immediate cause of the revolt, however, was the monarchy's attempt to raise revenues by imposing a poll tax or a flat charge on each adult member of the population. Peasants in eastern England, the wealthiest part of the country, refused to pay the tax and expelled the collectors forcibly from their villages. Now, this action sparked a widespread rebellion of both peasants and townspeople led by a well-to-do peasant called Watt Tyler, and a preacher named John Ball. The latter preached an effective message against the noble class. As recounted by French chronicler Jean-Francois, Good people, things cannot go right in England and never will, until goods are held in common, 
and there are no more villains and gentlefolk. But we are all one and the same. In what way are those whom we call lords greater masters than ourselves? How have they deserved it? Why do they hold us in bondage? If we all spring from a single father and mother, Adam and Eve, how can they claim or prove that they are lords more than us, except by making us produce and grow the wealth which they spend? Now the revolt was initially successful as rebels burned down the manor houses of aristocrats, lawyers, and government officials, and murdered several important uh, officials, including the Archbishop of Canterbury. After the peasants marched on London, the young King Richard II, aged 15, promised to accept the rebels' demands if they returned to their homes. They accepted the king's word and dispersed. But the king went back on his word and, with the assistance of the aristocrats, arrested hundreds of the rebels. The poll tax was eliminated, however, and in the end most of the rebels were pardoned. Revolts also erupted in the cities. Commercial and industrial activity suffered almost immediately from the Black Death. An oversupply of goods and an immediate drop in demand led to a decline in trade after 1350. Some industries suffered greatly. Florence's woolen industry, one of the giants, produced 70,000 to 80,000 pieces of cloth in 1338, and in 1378 it was yielding only 24,000 pieces. Bourgeois merchants and manufacturers responded to the decline in trade and production by attempting to restrict competition and resist the demands of the lower classes. In urban areas where capitalist industrialists paid low wages and managed to prevent workers from forming organizations to help themselves, otherwise known as unions, industrial revolts broke out throughout Europe. Ghent experienced one in 1381, Rouen in 1382. Most famous, however, was the revolt of the Ciampi in Florence in 1378. The Ciampi were wool workers in Florence's most prominent industry. In the 1370s, not only was the woolen industry depressed, but the wool workers saw their real wages decline when the coinage in which they were paid was debased. Their revolt won them some concessions from the municipal government, including the right to form guilds and be represented in the government, but their newly won rights were short-lived. Authorities ended Chompy participation in the government by 1382. Although the peasant and urban revolts sometimes resulted in short-term gains for the participants, the uprisings were quickly crushed and their gains lost. Accustomed to ruling, the established classes easily formed a united front and quashed dissent. Nevertheless, the rural and urban revolts of the 14th century ushered in an age of social conflict that characterized much of later European history. In our next lesson, we're going to focus on war and political instability. Uh, specifically, we're going to talk about the Hundred Years' War. Please make sure that you've taken notes on this lecture. You may bring your notes to class for a quiz. Uh, quizzes are either announced or unannounced, but I will permit you to use handwritten notes from the lectures. So as long as you're reading the textbook and following along with the lectures online, you should do well. Thank you for watching the video, and I will see you in class.